The Safety Task Force podcast is arming you with the necessary tools to combat safety in our fast-paced, dynamic world. Our interviews bring you the latest and greatest safety solutions from industry experts. If you're new to the industry or looking for ways to expand your knowledge and stay up to date with global safety trends, this podcast is for you. Welcome back to another episode of Safety Task Force. This week, I have Zach Green with LumaWare Incorporated. Welcome, Zach. Emily, thank you so much for having me today. Absolutely. So, Zach, help us get to know you. Tell us a little bit about your background and how LumaWare came about. Sure. So, I used to be in the Marine Corps about 50 pounds ago. And uh, when I got out, I kind of missed the brotherhood and the camaraderie. And uh, then September 11th happened. And that was a day, uh, obviously, that affected all of us personally and especially as our country. And I had a lot of, I don't know if you would call it survivor's guilt, but I just didn't feel comfortable that I was out in the civilian world getting, you know, uh, being able to sleep in the morning and getting nice and fat and happy. And my buddies were out there in Afghanistan, Iraq, taking the fight to the enemy. So I, um, I've always wanted to be a firefighter. And I figured that was the push that I needed. So right after September 11th, 2001, I joined our local volunteer fire department. And um, it, was, it was a great experience. I served almost 15 years on the fire department and uprising them to the rank of a fire lieutenant. But something happened on one of our very first live fire exercises that really stuck with me. And that is I got lost in the dark. When you have a fire, there's two things that happen. Number one, usually the electric is interrupted. And number two is usually the smoke conditions are so intense that they will actually block out the light if the power's still on in the structure. So I'm working my way down the hallway. I've got my 80 pounds of gear on my back and my clothes and everything else. You don't have a lot of dexterity because everything's so big and bulky. And I realize I got to get down this hallway. And and I know that usually at the end of a hallway is always a, a stairwell. So I look for the stairwell, and I can't not only not find a stair case, I can't find any um, doors. And I realize I'm not in a hallway. I'm actually in a walk-in closet, and I'm trapped. And I look down at my regulator. I had about 20 minutes of air left, and I realize if I don't do something significant, I'm going to be in very serious trouble. So I remember thinking about the training and talking about what we went through, and, and I followed uh, the hose line back and eventually found my way out. And uh, as I was talking to the um, captain, I said, you know, look, I was really upset. I mean, I was literally on the verge of being in tears. And he starts making fun of me and laughing at me. He said, look, that's just what happens in the fire service. You have to get used to being uncomfortable and disoriented and not having accountability of your tools and each other. And I'm thinking like, no, that's not acceptable. So my full-time job was at Eli Lilly. I was in brand development, marketing, and strategy development. And I remember what we always learned in Lilly is when we sell pharmaceutical solutions, we don't sell a pill. We don't sell the chemicals that are in the pill. We talk about a problem and the solution we have to the problem. So in the Eli Lilly sense, the problem could be your HbA1Cs are low and cause you to have diabetes. The solution is insulin to help cure your diabetes or, or maintain it. So what I thought, the problem we have here is you can't see in the dark. You get disoriented, you lose track of your tools. The solution is how do we find a visual light reference point that other firefighters can use on their tools and on their gears. And so I started to do some research on alternative lighting and everything seemed to be around a battery or electricity. But there's this guy named Murphy and he's got this law that's pretty darn solid that anything that can go wrong will go wrong at the worst time. And it's really true in the fire service because you got heat, you've got water, and anytime we have stuff with batteries or electricity, they always seem to fizzle out on us. So I discovered this incredible photoluminescent technology. Think of it as like glow sticks on steroids that doesn't need a chemical, doesn't need a battery source, doesn't need any other material, just light. And it glows so bright, it can actually cut through the darkness of the smoke. So I was able to take that material, embed it in a couple different types of uh, polymers, I put some into silicone, I put some into epoxy, some into other types of materials, put it onto my helmet. I go into a fire a couple months later. All everybody can see is the green glow coming off of my helmet as we're going down the hallway. And by the time I got outside, guys were saying, who in the hell had that glow in the dark stuff? I want to buy it. And I was like, well, that was me. And they're like, where'd you buy it from? I'm like, well, actually, I I had it made. So guys start throwing $20 bills at me. Over the next six months, I would drive from fire station to fire station, selling this out of the trunk of my car. 
Uh, unfortunately, the only place I could show that was dark enough in the fire station was the bathroom. So I'd knock on the door of the fire station and say, hey, I'm a Zach. I'm a firefighter from the Cincinnati area. Can we go in the bathroom and turn the lights off together? And if they didn't beat me <laughs> up, they usually said, oh, this is pretty cool. Yeah, we'll check it out. I made 5000 bucks in six months. Eventually realized that I had an opportunity here after my fire chief had sat me down and said, look, Zach, this is remarkable. Stop treating this as a hobby. And I remember a quote from Teddy Roosevelt. He said that when you're faced with a monumental decision, the best thing to do is the right thing. The next best thing to do is the wrong thing. But the worst thing to do is nothing. So I ended up refinancing my house, maxed out my credit cards, took every penny out of my 401k, started buying inventory, went to a trade show, a big firefighter trade show in Indianapolis. In three days, we sold almost $100,000 worth of product. The problem is I didn't have raw material. I didn't have ability to fill the orders, but I figured it out. And that was almost 10 years ago. I'm proud to say that we have now over 80,000 firefighters in 25 countries using our products. And that also opened up a new line of products called LumaWare Safety that makes the same materials that the firefighters use to make exit signs that don't need batteries, light bulbs, or electricity. And also materials that goes in the stairwells that has to do with the building and fire code updates to make sure that if the power goes out in a building, you can find your way out the stairwell. Awesome. So that's kind of what we are going to talk about today is in what ways do you guys help warehouses as they experience power outages or whatever else may cause those issues? Yeah. So the problem that I experienced in that hallway when in that in the closet when the power went out is the same problems that all of your customers, clients, and prospects experience in a warehouse when the power goes out. There is a primal fear of the darkness. It's not a learned fear like the boogeyman or Dracula. This is something we're born with being scared of the dark. And two things happen again. You get disoriented, and when you get disoriented, you panic. And when you panic, bad things stop to happen. You, your, your, air, your oxygen doesn't get to the brain enough. You start thinking differently. And you can talk to people in a warehouse that have worked there for 20 years at the exact same workstation. But when that power goes out, they can't find their way out. So we have a whole portfolio of products at LumaWare Safety that can help in the case of a power failure. Now, we never want to replace a generator or a backup battery lighting system. That's always primary. But about 35% of the time, generators fail. And the reason they fail is for a multitude of reasons, ranging from not, not properly testing them and working them out to a bird uh, nest may be in there to the diesels gelling to a whole host of different problems. This is the last line of defense, not the primary line of defense. So with these okay. solutions, we can put them in many different warehouse situations to help with safety in the dark. But I think what your, your, your prospects and clients will be more interested in because the chance of a power failure, it's there, but it's not happening every week. Sure. There's 100 million exit signs in the United States. Every one of those exit signs needs batteries, light bulbs, and electricity. They use carbon dioxide. They end up in a landfill with those bulbs and batteries. What we have is the ability to go into these warehouses and buildings, take out the old electric exit signs, replace them with these exit signs. They all meet the code. They last forever, 25-year guarantee, lifetime expectancy. But now you're saving almost $50 per sign per year. You look at a big warehouse that has a couple hundred exit signs, think about all the money you're going to save from electricity, light bulbs, battery testing, and everything else. Right. So you mentioned um, the business codes there. Your products do meet all of the international business code standards? Yeah, so there's two, two areas within our business. One area is the exit signs. The other area is what we call egress, which is getting out of the building. So on the exit signs, those um, follow either the NFPA or the IBC or IFC, building code or fire code. In that section 1013.5 of the building code and fire code of each state or section 71075 of the NFPA, states that in order for an exit sign to, to be certified, it has to meet the UL 924 standard. What that standard is, is that from 50 to 100 feet away, you have to be able to see that exit sign for 90 minutes after the power went out. So on electric signs, that means that battery has to charge it up for 90 minutes or the generator. But in my case, the glow has to be visible. And since our glow is visible, we meet that standard. 
Uh, so there's absolutely no problem anywhere with the exception of the city of Chicago. For some reason, the, the electric union in the city of Chicago has fought to not allow this to be non-electrified, but everywhere else you can use this. So they're all code compliant. The second component is there is also a requirement in both NFPA, the building code, and the fire code if you have a high rise. So a high rise is defined as anything that's 75 feet from lowest point of fire department access. You then are now required to have photoluminescence in the stairwell. So in case the power goes out, people can find their way out of the steps. Okay, makes sense. So when we look at the traditional exit signs that all of us are used to seeing, probably 90% of the places we go, right? And I'm near Cincinnati, so I think I really have seen some of your style of signs. I look through your website and they look completely different than your standard exit signs. But what are the main differences there between the, the traditional and then the LumaWare? Sure. So we've been very fortunate. We actually have a national contract with Kroger's, which is the second largest retailer in the country. We're replacing every single exit sign in any of their new and renovated stores. We just finished almost a thousand stores for Home Depot and replacing their exit signs at different Home Depots and then several other major national chains. The reason they chose to go with the LumaWare solution is exactly what your question was there. What's the difference? So again, in an exit sign, you have to have either a backup battery or you have to have an emergency circuit tied into that exit sign. If it's an emergency circuit, it has to be fed from two different directions. And an emergency circuit is a completely different circuit than what your lights are and your your electric and your your wall because the emergency circuit can't be turned off. It has to be on all the time. So the cost to install a traditional exit sign, even though you can buy one probably at Home Depot for $20 or $30, could be thousands of dollars. Now in a warehouse, it's even more expensive because you have to pay for the conduit, the wires, the junction boxes, the electrical labor. For every 125 feet that you're located away from the emergency circuit, that costs 125 bucks. So imagine you've got a big, huge 100,000 square foot warehouse and you've got a dozen exit signs in the middle of that warehouse. Each of those $20, $30 exit signs actually cost you thousands of dollars to install it. Now, the other problem is you have to test those exit signs by NFPA standards once every 30 days and then once a year for 90 minutes. Now, you got to get that high lift or that man lift up and go up to that exit sign, push the button for 30 seconds every month and test it. If you don't do the testing, which a lot of people don't do, and you have a fire and Mr. OSHA comes there or some type of situation, they you cannot provide them with the logbook of the testing of the exit signs, you're in big, big trouble. So that's one thing is the cost savings. Then you no longer have to replace the batteries or the light bulbs ever again. Then also the electric use. Now a typical LED exit sign only uses 44 kilowatt hours per year. That's a minimal amount of electricity. But if you got a thousand exit signs, that's not a minimal amount. That's a lot. Right. And so with ours, it's zero energy. So you've got the cost savings. You've got the big thing for me is safety. I talked about Mr. Murphy and his law. Anything can go wrong, will go wrong at the worst time. I, as a fire professional, want to make sure everybody's out of the building when I show up. Because if not, I make very dangerous actions to rescue people if we know they're going to be in there versus if we're in suppression, we, we don't have to put our lives at significant risk. If you can't find your way out of that warehouse and I have to search for you, that's how you kill firefighters. Almost every firefighter that's been dead in an industrial accident, industrial uh, structure fire was because they were searching for somebody and they got disoriented and and the building eventually collapsed or they were overcome with, with those conditions. So I implore people, get out of the building as quickly and as safely as possible. And the best way to do that is having a fail safe exit sign that you know is gonna work whenever you need it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So one other thing along with the exit signs is a lot of the older signs, I believe it is, are the tritium exit signs. So can you explain the removal process and what we should be aware of if if a company is looking to switch over? Yes, I'd like to share uh, an interesting little uh, tragic story about tritium. Uh, Back around the turn of the century in Pennsylvania, there was a um, kind of one of these utopian work societies where everybody worked in the factory, they lived upstairs, they went to the company store, it was kind of like controlled everything. And there was a watch factory that made 
uh, that had tritium paint, which is a glow-in-the-dark material that adds radioactive radium to it. So the radium actually acts as a catalyst, for the lack of a better word, to make it glow in the dark. Now, with our products, we don't use any nuclear or radioactive material. We just use light. So light energizes our crystals. They get excited. They glow. Well, in this case, they're using radium, tritium, to eradicate those. So what the women were doing is as they were painting the watch dials with this tritium paint or painting the clock dials, it was kind of cool to put it on their lips and on their eyes, and sometimes they would suck on the end of the paintbrush to kind of pull the bristles together. Well, out of nowhere, all these young women in their 20s and 30s were all dying of cancer, and they couldn't understand. And since it was kind of this utopian society, they just buried them in the back of the uh, factory, at the factory um, uh, 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 cemetery. Well, about 20 years ago, this guy was researching this issue, and it had to do with, you know, work face safety and what happened, you know, back before the OSHA and the union days. And they exhumed a couple of the bodies. And now these are bodies that have been in the ground for 80, 90 years. They still had glow around their esophageal pathway and their, their neck and around their mouth. So it's dangerous, dangerous stuff is what I'm trying to get at. That's crazy. Believe it or not, that same material that killed all those women is still being used today in exit signs. And what a tritium exit sign benefit is you don't need any light for it to work. You can put it in a movie theater. The problem is if it cracks or breaks, you've exposed people to that same tritium that killed all those women back uh, many years ago. The other thing is they're regulated by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So what that means is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission knows you have them. When they expire after about 10 years, you can't just throw them in the trash. There is a special process you have to do to recycle these. And then there's also a very substantial amount of paperwork that needs to file to show that they've been properly remediated. So LumaWare is the nation's largest recycler of tritium exit signs. If you have it, we are, I believe we're the only company that has an all-in-one system where all you have to do is you get a box with our exit sign in it, you take our exit sign out, you put the tritium exit sign in the box, it's got a prepaid FedEx or UPS uh, label on it. We have special type of packaging there to control the uh, radiation that's in there. It goes to us. We process it. We do all the paperwork for you, and you guys don't have to worry about anything. If you were to get rid of your own tritium exit signs, there's about five different agencies you have to file paperwork with. It, there's a process before you're even allowed to return the tritium exit signs. You have to get a return authorization receipt from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And then you also have to find packaging and a way to get those shipped. So the beauty with LumaWare is we can take your old tritiums that are expired or even the ones that you just don't want in your building, recycle them out, replace them with LumaWare. The other alternative is if you don't want to use a LumaWare sign in exchange, you'd have to put electric sign in, but now you have to run all that new wiring and everything. And since it's usually an existing structure, that can get really expensive because you have to repair all those holes that you had to drill in to run that new wiring. Sure. So how would you recommend a business begin the process of replacing their current signs with LumaWare signs? What are the different things they should consider? So the easiest thing to do is just simply go to LumawareSafety.com. Um, we have some great videos, some really great infographics. It takes you through step-by-step -step of how to identify your tritium signs, what you need to do, and then start that process from there. At the end of the day, all you need to do is count up how many tritium sign faces. Now, keep in mind, a double-sided sign counts as two. It doesn't count as one, so it's how many faces. You simply order one of the LumaWare recycling kits. The box shows up on your front doorstep. You take the old exit signs down. You take, put the new exit signs up. Drop it off at your UPS or FedEx with the prepaid label on it, and we handle absolutely everything else from there. Awesome. Well, Zach, is there anything else that you'd like to add to the conversation that we haven't covered today? No, I just we're really excited to have the opportunity to, to, to speak with you and, and share our story about this alternative safety lighting technology that's out there. Obviously, I'd be remiss to not recognize what's happened in the last three to four months with COVID and how that's changed everything. And right. being that we are a safety company, um, we are still doing a tremendous amount of business in our photoluminescent safety products, but we've also created a new line of products called ClearGuard, and the ClearGuard products are all designed to be uh, COVID protection materials. So right now we have four product lines. Um, we have uh, a quarter inch thick lucite barriers that have pass-throughs at the bottom that you can be used in the office setting. We can also set those up in factory floors. 
by CDC guidelines, if you cannot maintain six foot separation, you are required to have a physical barrier. We make uh, face shields, which are much superior to face masks because they protect your eyes and they also um, allow you to see the face rather than just the mask. We use a 3M microfluidic film that's the same type of film that's used in the operating rooms. No fogging, no glare. And then we also have a couple other series of barriers that are more temporary that could be used like on a school desk or maybe an office desk that's made out of a corrugated plastic and a clear window. And then we have our air series that hangs down from the ceiling. So right now the big focus is trying to get warehouses safe uh, so we can return back to work and get back to regular staffing levels. And uh, at LumaWare, we can help you guys with that. And then once everything's back and running and hopefully we get back to some sense of normalcy, then there's a more of an opportunity to start addressing those safety needs and cost savings with the other LumaWare product lines. Great. Great. Well, Zach, thanks for being on the show today. We really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully we can talk later. Great. Thank you so much, Emily. Have a wonderful day. You too. That's all for this week's episode of the Safety Task Force podcast. Thanks for listening and be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at BeastAgentWN. 